I'm a London-based working photojournalist and photography tutor with 15-year career focusing on the politics of race, gender, identity, migration, and displacement of people due to climate change and armed conflict. I'm the founder of VX Pictures and Frontliner magazine, and I'm one of the leading tutors in visual journalism and conflict reporting profession. Ethics and entrepreneurship are at the heart of everything I do. My educational programs promote, foster, and teach high-quality talent in national and international journalism by upskilling emerging professionals, student candidates like you, who would like to pursue a career in photojournalism. Via my course in photojournalism, I will teach you the difference between the news photographer, journalist, and photojournalists. We will talk about how to pick a subject, research and investigate it, and verify the facts offered to you by the story's protagonists. We will also learn about street and news photography, the ethical choices involved, the importance of adding accurate metadata in your photographic files, and why it's crucial to practice digital data asset management. It will be a fascinating journey to look forward to. Cool. Hi. It's, we're going to go to the next slide. So I hope everybody could catch up a little bit with that video. And if you have any questions, I guess at the end of the session, we can talk about it. But further, we're going we're gonna to be talking today about what are the four elements of a great photo. So I've chosen uh, several subjects to just basically share the essential knowledge about particular parts of what it means and how can we produce a good photograph. And um, I hope that will help to, to start with. So one of the important elements of, the, of, of, of a good photograph is light and then it's color and then it's composition. And then of course, it's subject. Other than subject, it's the idea of applying the rule of thirds in the photograph. So in, a, in, in producing a good photograph, we need to make sure that we're basically um, using our own instinct about, about the visuals, you know? But also, other than using our, our own instinct, is, is very important to understand who are we photographing, what is their mood and your mood, and where's the shoot taking place, what's going on around you. And uh, those are the very important details and the light. So basically, when we talk about what's going on around you, we have to have an understanding about the uh, physical circumstances where our subject is going to be standing. If it's going to be a photograph, a portrait for an editorial news or a, a news feature story, then we're gonna to have to understand our subject, the person that we are photographing. Who are they? Are they a writer? Are they a engineer of machinery? Or are they, let's say, I don't know, a commander or a soldier? So we need to take into consideration and understand and respect the fact that we cannot produce an editorial photograph of portraying a writer in a circumstantial situation when there is weapons around them, unless they are a war reporter, right? So, or we cannot take an editorial portrait of, um, civil engineer in, uh, in theater, right? So this is what it means when I'm saying it is important other than taking into consideration your own visual instinct is, is important to understand and know who are you photographing as early as possible in advance. It's important to understand where is the shoot taking place? Is that shoot taking place in theater? Is that shoot taking place in a library? or is that shoot taking place in, a, in an environment where there is some sort of a training center? It could be a, a football pitch. If the person is a sports person that's play, that plays football, it can be a basketball pitch. 
again, depending on the character and the professional commitment of that person in that professional field. So why do you need to know where is the shoot taking place? Because circumstantially, then you will be able to think about the light. What kind of light will you have available? And when the shoot is taking place, that means you will calculate about the timing of the day. Uh, at 12 noon, that you can have a stronger sunlight uh, against at 3 p.m. or at 10 a.m. So there are so many differences which you may have to calculate in order to prepare yourself. What kind of kit are you going to need to take with you when you go on the shoot? And with regards to the mood of the person and your mood, it is your mood depends on how much you kind of like the character of the person and that particular professional field and how much you have done a bit of a research to learn about that particular profession. For example, if you are uh, photographing a commander that is highly experienced in the war field, you might wanna learn and read a little bit about what a commander does in a, in, in a war zone. That way it will help you understand a little bit from an independent way of researching the character of the person you are photographing. And in case their moods change, you might as well easier understand where they come from. So the communication between you as a photographer and the subject, whoever the person is, with whatever professional field they come from and they're committed to, is very is the key, it is essential for you both to work together to produce a very effective and important portrait of the person that you're trying to visualize their character to your readers, to the, to, to, to the audience who's gonna, who's gonna, who's gonna see that, that photograph. Right, so that was it about those little details on preparation about when, when are you going to photograph someone it's it's the same equal if you're going to photograph an event if there is a protest it's very important you research to understand who is organizing the protest what is their political character what is their ideology where they come from what's their cause right so then when you get there you will understand you will have an already prepared understanding how you're going to visualize the story of this group of people taken to the streets for the reason they are taken to the streets, okay? And you can find yourself very easy to talk and communicate with them and you will easily find ways to get even more exclusive moments and shots of what happening, what is happening throughout the protest. Or it can be a gathering of a NGO or a charity to fundraise about something, you know, Again, it is very important you always research in advance as much information as, as possible. You fill in yourself with, with, with regards to who are you photographing as good as it is, as good as you will get out with pictures from that particular event. So when we talked about the four important elements of photography, we talked about the good composition, which is very important, of course. We don't have a good composition we're hardly managing to tell a story. So one of the important things to apply in composition is something what's called the old time classic composition technique of the rule of thirds. Let's look at some pictures and then, and, then, and, then, and then talk about it. Here we got a composition of the rule of thirds where, where photographer Ed Clark photographed this gentleman playing his harmonica and crying at the same time in a, in a US president's funeral in 1945. So is everybody seeing the, the, the mouse? Okay, great. So when we talk about composition, if you can see those angles, those lines, if you can see there's, there, is, there is this person there it's fully visible and it's clearly what they're doing, right? So 
the the photographer could have just cut cut their face through, you know, halfway, and that would have break that would have basically torn apart the composition of the photograph, and it would be very much quite aggressive to see what's happening with that person because you don't really know. And um, you can see that particular situation here on the right hand side of the photograph. However, the entirety of the photograph is fully well composed with the exception of this part. And the main attention is focused on the face of the person. It, 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 it's a photograph that fully applied the rule of thirds. So the reason why, as you can see, the, the, the man is, is crying and is looking forward high. And you might want to wonder, why is this photograph button on the bottom side not breathing as, as much as you would probably like to have it breathe? It's because the focus of the photograph is on the gaze of an actual human being that's been targeted to be photographed, to be captured in the moment. And wherever the gaze goes, you give your, 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 your subject space enough within the frame to breathe, right? So the composition is cut through here. You see in the next photograph, they decided to cut a little bit more so then the face of the woman is not halfway through because when he shot the original image, uh, which was the previous picture, you see her face was halfway through and so it jeopardized the, the composition. What they've done in the next shot, they cut it a little bit more closer to make sure the composition is not jeopardized. It can be seen that there is a human being. However, there is no more attention there, but the attention is going to be kept here for the audience to understand that the harmonica man playing the harmonica on the, at the funeral was crying. And if you want to see other people, what they were doing around, which is clearly visible to their faces, they were, they were, they were also, also crying. So basically the rule of thirds is, 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 is a, is a window of, you know, icon with like, like a grid where you can have an understanding easily with today's technology. How do you apply? Before people just had to guess and, you know, by their eye, measure the moment and snap the photograph. If some of you is wondering how rule of third uh, grid can be activated in an iPhone, you can, you can go to switch them on by going to settings, photos and cameras, and then you might have the option there. It's called grid and activate it. And when you try to take a picture, you will see the grid in the screen. And that way you can start to practice to apply the rule of thirds in your photographs. Here's again, why do we apply the rule of thirds? Because using the rule of thirds means the subject is not centered in the image, which is how many new photographs frame their shots instead of the focal points is off to one side. So some photographs, I don't have a photograph to, to show you the, the bad example of not applying the rule of thirds here, but you may have a situation where the photo, where, where the portrait of the person is photographed like this. Can anybody see me on the screen? I am improvising myself. This is no rule of the thirds because I'm not breathing here. And my gaze is looking there not there, right? So that is an absolutely not important unless somebody's pulling a gun on my head and trying to shoot me. Then, then this is well composed. <laughs> Sorry, I take so many examples with the guns because I've been for 15 years in the war, so and I'm still trying to go back. So I hope you understand what what it means to like when 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 the when the, when the object when the subject is centered. In, in the right attention of the photographic frame and it has enough space to breathe, that's when, you're, when, when you guess right to produce a decent photograph applying the rule of thirds.
as we said before, using the rule of third draws the viewer's eye into the composition instead of encouraging them to just glance at its center. So if you are missing out in applying rule of thirds in your photographs, the audience, the viewer will just glance into the photograph and will snap into the other one. But if you applied properly the rule of thirds, you will get the audience attention and they will stop in that photograph and they will want to see what's happening. Why? Because you successfully managed to compose properly. You successfully managed to complete the, the, the composition of the, of, 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 of the frame and capture the very moment of what was going on at the moment when you captured the photograph. So again, it's one of the most useful techniques and help you compose interesting and balanced shots. Let's look at the more examples. This is another example of rule of thirds applied. I told you earlier that if, if the photograph, if you're photographing me like this, not letting me breathe, then that's a wrong photograph unless something is happening in the, in, in the background. As you can see, this gentleman have relatively enough space to breathe. However, his gaze is directed towards me. This is a photograph I shot in by Tower Bridge path, uh, pedestrian and a wall in London. So the gentleman is looking at me at the very moment when I'm stepping at the photograph. So his gaze is properly addressed and everything else is happening on the background. And again, you can see the grid. This is yet another photograph as part of my street photography projects in London that I produced over the last six years. This is another, another one of those photographs, the street photographs in Fenture Street where the bankers go out to take a little break and have a snap of their lungs with cigarettes. And again, this is another situation where I applied the rule of thirds successfully with a 50 millimeter lens during a protest in 2015 in Kosovo. And, and people often ask me, how do you, how can you possibly do it in, in a situation like this when you may have to run for your life? It's once you practice enough, your brain is like a, is, is smarter than a computer. It will just, it will just work that way. When you take on the camera on your hands to like snap a photograph, it will know it already, your brain already knows and, 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 and establish the composition and you're just basically taking, taking the shot. So it's nothing really extraordinary about me. Somehow I'm the best, I'm, I'm not the best photographer. I'm just a photographer who practiced good and not long enough to, to, to train myself to understand more than average photographer, how the work should be done. Any one of you can do if you practice enough and if you're open to learn and, and learn from your mistakes. And I would say, Budi, that as somebody who learned about the rule of thirds and is not a natural photographer like you who can translate that into my shooting, I am able to translate it into my editing. So I doubt that I would ever take a photograph like that, but I might take a much bigger photograph. And then when I'm sitting down, I have the time to think, oh, I remember what Budi said about the rule of thirds and cut it, cut all the rest of it out so that that protester is in the third corner. So yeah, maybe the sort of cheats way to do it. I mean, even even if, if, if that does, as long as it does the job to grab the attention of the audience, which is the intention why we wanna we wanna produce a photograph, then it does the job, you know. And it, as long as it doesn't, how to say, falsify the truth of what was going on in the situation, yeah, that's very important. The ethics should always the photograph, whatever we produce, should always stick the truth of what it is whatever happened, it should keep its reality, its origin of what's going on. Right, another photograph of such. And I think we are a little bit, we are at the end, but I wanted to talk here a little bit about the captions and metadata. Whenever you produce the photographs, 
let's say you've been shooting during the day today and you come home, you have a set of, I don't know, 50 images or maybe a hundred. If you have a digital camera, if you have a film camera, you're shooting less because you want to spare your film and you want to make sure when you're snapping, you're snapping the right thing. But we're talking about digital photography. So it is very important that you come home, you go to your computer and you download your photographs that you produced today right away. My recommendation is you create a folder which you would name on the country's name. Let's say UK or Switzerland. And then you create a subfolder in Switzerland and say, if it's Zurich, or if it's, I don't know, Geneva, you, you, you create that name with that, that subfolder named Geneva. And then that is very important to be, is it Geneva 2021 or Geneva 2022? And then you create another subfolder and then you create another subfolder with, with the name of the month, whether it's July or it's June or August. And then you say the next subfolder 16 July 2022, and you name it, you give a title of what were you shooting? Heat wave, politics in Downing Street, or politics in Geneva, or people protesting of something. And then you gather all that batch of photographs, drop them there. And when you will drop your photographic files into your right folder the way you organize your 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 data asset management uh, you will see that every single photograph is automatically named by your photo camera you may have seen examples of img as an image underline one two three or whatever the number is keep that in mind that those automatic names will go up to 9999 and eventually automatically will start again from number one. Which means if you are a regular shooter, eventually your photographic files will start having the same name and somehow in your system, you might have your photographic files that are recently produced with the same name somehow replacing your previous photographic file, which you may shot three years ago, I don't know, in Alaska or New York or, or Kabul, uh, a photograph and you lost that image, okay? So it's really important every time you put your photographic files in your folder of today, you put them in your uh, photographic software, post-processing software, some people use Photoshop. I use Lightroom and it's really practical because in Lightroom, I can rename an entire batch of pictures. Like if I shot today 200 photographs, I can just drag and drop them all together in Lightroom and I will rename them with a date of today, a series number from one to whatever it reaches and a name of the photo on every photographic file of what happened today, of what is the story of this photographic set. And that way will guarantee you that you will never lose your photographic files because you will always have them. And in case you wanna post them in your website, original file name of your photograph is always there. And if let's say there is an editor who wants to buy that picture from you, they will say, I want that picture. All you have to do is just to go in their original file name, copy that and paste it in your system, in your computer or in your hard drive and your photograph will be found in the spot. So you don't have to, find, to think about how many times are you gonna be spending to try to find that photograph, which I don't even know when I shot it but I know which photograph the editor is asking. And guess what? The price for that photograph might just be 50,000 <laughs> pounds, you know? And, and, and you bought yourself another camera because that's all I think when I, get, when I have good money. <laughs> I wanna think of what's my next good camera I need to shoot.
And the reason why I'm very enthusiastic on investing in technology is because I make a living out of it. Yeah. So please, I strongly encourage you invest in good technology if you make a living out of what you do. If you don't make a living out of what you do, a reasonably good camera that is coming from a mobile phone, it's perfectly enough. It does the job, it shoots the picture. All you have to do is keep in mind that you need to produce a good composition and never, never forget the rule of thirds. You don't need to invest in technology unless you really earn money out of what you do. So don't waste your money. Thank you very much. That's all from me. Please, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Rudy. Some of those things were just life changing for me um, in my uh, photography, my use of photography for the ideas partnership. And um, just to follow up on what you were saying about how you that the systems that you have as a photographer, this was definitely something that we've got better at at the ideas partnership that we probably still need to get better still at. Because of course, when you're running an NGO, then it's not just your photographs, but you're also co collecting photographs from a whole range of people. Maybe if you're in the head office, or if you're maybe not even the same country as the projects that are running, then um, you're receiving those sometimes directly from the field, sometimes you're getting them off social media if you're doing the comms. And so that was something that really made our lives a lot easier was when we constructed a folder where all photographs that, not all photographs, which maybe is different from being a professional photographer, but all photographs that we thought were particularly great, powerful, told a story, uh, were an encapsulation of what we, um, what we were about. We made sure that each of those was um, saved in one central place with a title that said, as you recommended, the theme of it. Because if, exactly as you say, if the, if the titles are IMG 791, then that's very difficult to remember. Is this the photo of the kindergarten or is this the photo of the vaccination campaign yes. with the women's literacy? So it sounds really obvious, but when you're starting out, I think it's, it's, too, it's, it's manageable to be able to um, have a look through your own Facebook pictures or to know that you saved it on your desktop somewhere or but it's when you kind of make the step from being a very small NGO to being one where more than one person is sourcing the photographs where more than one person is needing to use the photographs then just having a centralized system so that we know that when we're looking for our top five pictures to share generally what we do or an image to tell a donor that what this project really looks like um, or mm -hmm. when I see a particularly good picture, I think I'm going to just save it in that folder because then the next time that I'm looking for an image to exemplify our work, there'll be that kid who's got, you know, a cheeky smile or is, you know, looking like they've just achieved something great. So, yeah, um, just yeah. to, re sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, go on. Go on. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just, just, just to, to, to improvise and, show, and illustrate with, with, with examples what I meant with the way I organize. For example, this is my website through which I sell most of my editorial and news, news work. So all these photographs that you see, they are featured images of, of uh, over 30,000 individual, individual photographic uh, stories that I produced. So, if we go to news and the galleries, you can see here, I have collection names. For example, United Kingdom, and then I have England 2022, Northern Ireland 2021, England 2022, England 2020 again, right? And then let's go in England 2022. Here, I've got all different stories of every day that I covered that have names, and if we click on here, then here's the entire photographic set of, let's say, what I covered yesterday, the Britain rally for Ukraine. And when I was telling you earlier about the photographic files, this is the one. Can everybody see what I selected? So if an editor goes and say to me, Vudi, I need this photograph, all I need, is, I need the original photograph because obviously I post produced the images. And then when I when I when I down, when I load them into the website, I gave them a little bit less. Um, I, I reduced the capacity of, of the quality because I don't want my website to be overloaded. So if a print editor wants to print this photograph in their newspaper, they will send me the link 
through the link, I will know exactly where the photograph is and it's here. And all I have to do then after that is, sorry for a second, go on the search engine and basically, can, can everybody see the screen what I'm looking for? Yeah, maybe um, maybe you cannot see it. I think your call has uh, interrupted your computer. Probably. So can you see now? Yeah. Yeah. So basically I just go on in, in, in the folder in, in my computer and paste the name here in the search engine and that's it. I've got the photograph, which is the original one. Can everybody see this? So here is the original photograph and here is the photograph that is already online in, in, uh, in, in the website. So the editors basically with this photograph, they can post produce it however they wish to, to cut it, to, to put letters on it, you know, messaging or kind of a story short or titles or something. So it's really important to like, do this kind of commit really it needs a commitment what is when 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 it comes to data asset management you really need to be like committed to organize your own archives with collections and galleries by year by the name of the country by the name of the of the month and then by the name of the date when that happened slash the name of the events every other folder should be renamed like that Thank you so much, Budi. I'm sure people have got some questions. So is there anything that somebody would like to ask either uh, with using their voice or writing in the chat? I saw that Florence uh, asked a question. I know she's had to leave early, but she did put a question earlier um, saying, uh, asking about editing software. Do you have any sort of quick tips on editing software? Yes. Again, about the what kind of software you use depends on what you do. As a photojournalist, I don't need to manipulate the photographs. All I have to do is cut if I need to crop something and I have to fill in the metadata and captions. So Lightroom is the best software you can get with regards to this profession. But if you want to manipulate the photograph, like retouching and this and that, then Photoshop is the way to go. But again, I don't know how to use the Photoshop because I'm not a fashion photographer and I don't, I don't prefer to intervene in my photographs ever. Unless my photograph is by chance or the moment overexposed or underexposed, then I will use the Lightroom to give it a little bit more light and exposure and then you play a little bit with contrast and clarity, and that's all I can do. Thank you. I saw another question in the chat. So Eric Jan, if I'm pronouncing your name right, uh, when photogra photographing an event with many people, like a rally, how do you apply the rule of thirds, for example, in those photos? Yeah. When it comes to when it comes to individual photo, when it comes to photographing the individuals then you apply the rule of thirds depending on the gaze of the individual where they are looking at. When it comes to photograph a group of people, more than two or three, then you understand, um, understandably want to give the power of gaze to the messages these people are willing to deliver. Whether there is a person shouting, you know, uh, kind of slogans, or whether there is a person holding a placard then you pay attention to those particular details in applying the rule of thirds while trying to make sure your composition is intact. As a, another personal example from a non-professional photographer who does the cropping that Judy doesn't need to do, um, we had a, a prize winner from amongst our um, the group of girls at our girls club who are uh, tackling early marriage. And we had a photograph that was taken off this prize giving with this girl who'd won a, a prize as an international activist of the year award from a Canadian organization. So there were lots of people, lots of clapping, lots of um, lots of other actors within the photograph. And 
it was a fine photo, but then when my colleague, who's much more proficient than I am, uh, photography, said, well, we could crop it. And she cropped it so that the, the girl who was receiving the prize was in a third in from the, from the left and a third down from the top. And then the rest of the photographs just had everybody looking at her. And suddenly we had a focus for the picture, you know, where before it had just been a representation of the room filled with people and she was one of them. By cropping it down so that she was in that, that sweet spot, we were really able mm -hmm. to make the picture about her. And I was really, it was a, a great example to me of how, uh, the rule of thirds tells a story because it draws your eye to the main narrative feature instead of just being a representation of messy reality. Mm -hmm. You can see, for example, I don't know if everybody can see the screen now what I'm sharing. It was a protest of uh, Abortion Rights UK against the uh, intentions to, to, to criminalize abortion in the United States. So the protest was happening in London and uh, and then you know you you can see these two ladies leading the protest. How powerful they were! They were protesting, and 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 then again, I couldn't decide to single-handedly uh, focus only in one or another person because also the image, you know, those, those messages in those in those in those in those placards was very equally important, you know, because the audience will see the person shouting and then and, and really angry and concerned. But then if you show only this person without caption, because captions of the photographs will help audience understand what's happening in the photograph. But this photograph in particular doesn't need captions. Why? Because you can see uh, protesters really angry and, and, and shouting. And then on top of their heads, you can see very clear messages Right, so you don't really necessarily have to put a caption on this photograph because it does tell the story itself. Yeah, that's a good example. So you have a similar situation. So a rule of thirds is also about, you know, putting into the center of attention what is the most important of what is happening in the moment when you're capturing the, 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 the events, when the moment when you're producing the photograph. And again, you might have situations like, again, like earlier I said, you know, uh, something might jeopardize your, your composition. For example, this half of the placard is a little bit, you know, jeopardizing the composition here too. But again, the message on the chest of the women here and her shouting, and then there is this, this, other, this other message in this placard, you know, it does grab that attention. So uh, um, a tertiary and secondary subject in the photograph doesn't pay, doesn't grab your attention anymore. So you don't have to be worried about jeopardizing your composition at, at, at some extent. But again, as much as circumstances allows you to, it's very important to pay attention to secondary and third and tertiary parts of what is playing within inside your frame so you can include them as good as possible.